Welcome. I'm Dr. Len Calabrese from the R.J. Fazenmeyer Center for Clinical Immunology, welcoming you to TB testing in the 21st century. I wanted to start this program off with an overview of tuberculosis because many of you uh, tuning in right now are not infectious disease experts. I've invited Kevin Winthrop, who's Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Disease at the Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. Kevin is one of the leading authorities in TB in our country and an excellent teacher. And I have challenged him to tell you everything you need to know about TB in 20 minutes. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks, Len. It's a pleasure to be here at uh, Cleveland Clinic. Uh, Len has challenged me to talk about tuberculosis in 20 minutes, and uh, I told him I can do it in 18. Uh, with this talk, I'd like to give you a brief overview of the epidemiology, the diagnosis, and treatment of TB. Uh, particularly, uh, this talk is supposed to serve as a foundation for some of the later talks in this series meant to dig deeper in the screening and prevention of TB in the setting of uh, biologic therapy, particularly as it's employed against autoimmune disease. So TB, tuberculosis, is caused by the tuberculosis complex of organisms. Usually this is Mycobacterium tuberculosis in humans. However, Mycobacterium bovis is also an important cause of human TB. Mycobacterium africanum is a, a more rare cause. Uh, and there are several other species within this TB complex that typically affect animals and generally not humans. Now the rest of this slide is the WHO mantra. Uh, many of us stand up and give this uh, in, in all our TB talks. We think that one third of the world is infected with TB and 90% uh, this infection remains latent uh, and generally does not cause disease. However, in 10% of patients, uh, immunosuppression will uh, cause this disease to reactivate, quote unquote, or progress from latent infection to active TB. And this 10% occurs over a lifetime. Uh, the highest risk of this happening is in the first two years after infection, but a lifetime risk of approximately 10% is, is thought to exist. Now briefly, TB pathogenesis. Now generally speaking, TB is transmitted by inhalation of the TB bacilli. It can also be transmitted by ingesting uh, MTB bacilli in the form of raw milk or other uh, products. Now once inhaled, the TB bacilli replicates. It is uh, engulfed by pulmonary uh, or alveolar macrophages. Within the macrophage, it will replicate and eventually spill out of the macrophage and disseminate hematogenously throughout the body. Uh, at this point, the body attempts to stop this spread with various cytokines and cells, uh, immune cells being activated. Uh, and the body has two main mechanisms to stop this spread, one with granuloma formation around the bacilli, uh, and this is a process driven by TNF-alpha. And then within macrophages and other cells, intracellular killing of the TB bacilli, uh, a process that's very important or very driven by uh, interferon gamma. This is the classic chest radiographic appearance of pulmonary TB. You've all seen this in your training in medical school. You can see the right upper lobe cavity. You can see the right middle lobe cavity and infiltrate. Uh, this is the classic uh, x-ray that, that, again, you'll recognize from your training. Now, I will point out that in the setting of uh, immune, immunosuppression, particularly in the setting of biologic therapies, uh, approximately half the TB that presents in this setting will have a normal chest x-ray. Uh, these cases uh, have a high degree of extrapulmonary features uh, or disseminated features. Approximately 50% will have extrapulmonary involvement. The epidemiology of TB in the United States. So we are at historic all-time lows for TB in the United States. In 2010, just over 11,000 cases were reported. Now you can see in the early 80s, or late 80s rather, we had what was called the quote-unquote resurgence, a brief uptick in cases. This was largely due to uh, the defunding of our public health infrastructure, or at least our TB control uh, capacity in the United States. We had greater case-to-case -case transmission in the U.S. However, we refunded and, and hustled really to contain that transmission. And since uh, the early 90s, you can see a steady trend in the de decline of TB in this country. And again, at all-time low levels. Now, our national average is 3.6 cases per 100,000 individuals. And you can see the states in dark, California, Texas, Florida, New York, and several others, generally places that, that have high levels of immigration. Uh, these are still the states that have the highest levels of TB. But you can see much of the country uh, would be considered a low, uh, very low prevalence with, with rates below the national average of 3.6 per 100,000. So I like this slide. This is a slide from the CDC website. 
uh, showing trends in TB among foreign-born individuals in the U.S. over the last several years. And graphically, what's being depicted here is on the, the left-hand side of this diagram, you have the number of cases on the right. It's the percentage of cases or the proportion of cases that are uh, in foreign-born individuals uh, among all U.S. cases. So the line trending up, uh, where as you can see on the right-hand side of the figure, approximately 60 percent of the cases in, of TB cases in this country or in, are in foreign-born individuals. The bars represent the absolute raw number of cases. You can see over the last 15 years, the raw number of cases has stayed somewhat similar between 6 and 7,500, 6,000, 7,500 cases. However, the proportion has steadily increased. Uh, in Oregon, for example, where I'm from, 75% of the cases in the state are in foreign-born individuals. So clearly, this is the single biggest risk factor for TB in this country. It has to do with where you were born. Now, here's worldwide TB epidemiology. You can see I have labeled this slide a priori probability. And the reason I've labeled it that way is the rest of uh, somewhat of this talk and some of the other talks really talk about screening for TB and the use of uh, tuberculin skin test and interferon gamma release assays and screening for TB. And a lot of the interpretation of the results of those assays has to do with the patient's a priori probability. What is their baseline probability that they could be infected with TB? And you can see if you come from North America or Western Europe or Australia, uh, the, the rates of TB in those countries are very low, generally below 24, 20 to 24 th per 100,000. Uh, the rates are, of course, much higher in uh, China, Russia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and some of the uh, countries, Peru, and other countries in South America. So clearly, if patients come from these areas, they have a much higher risk of being infected at baseline. The clinical presentation of TB. Now, this is an old slide from uh, 10 years ago or so, but generally speaking, this has not changed. Uh, we have seen a slight increase in the proportion of TB cases in this country that are uh, extrapulmonary, and this may relate to the higher numbers of uh, persons we have in this country that are immunocompromised, uh, but, but we don't know for sure. But generally speaking, three quarters of pulmonary, or I'm sorry, three quarters of TB in the country are uh, pulmonary in manifestation. And about uh, the other quarter are generally, most of those are extrapulmonary cases, and there's this five to seven percent uh, that are both. And within the extrapulmonary group, you can see lymphatic TB is most common, but then pleural, peritoneal, meningeal, some of these other forms of TB also exist. And again, it's worth being aware of this as a rheumatologist or dermatologist, whatever specialist you are using uh, biologic therapies and other immunosuppressive therapies, again, these extrapulmonary forms of TB will be more common. Uh, here's a chest CT from a, a patient I helped take care of. This is a patient that had uh, a large cavity in the left uh, lung field, of course, in the right lung field, there's also a large multiloculated cavity. This was a patient with multi-drug resistant TB, which I'll talk more about in a minute. Uh, this was a patient of mine with scrofula. This is scrofula. This patient was from South America and had uh, three or four large uh, necrotic lymph nodes in the right cervical chain uh, that were biopsied by an ENT specialist and showed KZ8 and granulomas and grew out MTB complex. Uh, actually, it grew out M. bovis within that complex. Uh, likely, she uh, became infected from drinking raw milk. She did have a history of that. Uh, where she grew up, uh, there was many patients that used raw milk for, or many people that used raw milk for cheese making and drinking, etc. Anyway, this is a nice presentation of scrofula uh, in an adult coming from an endemic area with large lymph nodes. Certainly, TB is, is high on the list. Another patient of mine, very interesting, a woman from India who had a prosthetic knee uh, in, in place. And, Approximately four to six weeks after surgery, she developed these two draining, uh, draining sinuses uh, that continued to drain pus and reopen. She had several sites that would open and close and open and close. Eventually, this was cultured and found to be TB within her knee. Uh, we also looked in her chest where she had infiltrates and AFB in her sputum, although the AFB ended up being non-TB mycobacterium in her chest. Uh, but again, very interesting case, and she was treated for many, many months and uh, eventually healed. So an example of some extra pulmonary forms of TB for you to consider, the classic chest radiograph of uh, pulmonary TB, how do we treat these people? Uh, 
These are our drugs, and some of these drugs are, are quite old, and, and there are a few newer drugs, and there's some in the pipeline, but generally speaking, most of our uh, therapeutic armamentarium against tuberculosis is quite old. So you can see the first-line drugs there, isoniazid, rifampin, pyrazinamide, ethambutol. Most patients with active TB are placed on those four drugs uh, in daily fashion, sometimes intermittent fashion. Uh, and pyrazinamide is a very important drug for the first two months uh, due to its sterilizing activity. After two months, generally speaking, patients remain on isoniazid and rifampin for the remainder of their treatment course, which total duration of TB therapy really varies, but generally speaking, most patients are cured with a course of six months. Uh, sometimes that's extended to nine months. In the cases of drug resistance or noncompliance, that will go even farther out. And the second line drugs, streptomycin, cycloserine, you can see a number of drugs there. Of the drugs there listed, moxifloxacin or the fluoroquinolone group probably are the most used, and we will use those uh, in multi-drug resistant TB or INH resistant TB. Uh, they tend to have good killing activity of TB bacilli, somewhat similar to isoniazid. In terms of toxicities, uh, isoniazid, of course, uh, is a hepatotoxic drug. Rifampin is much less so. Pyrazinamide of this list, though, however, is the most hepatotoxic drug uh, in the first-line drugs. And so oftentimes we will see LFT rises and liver problems. It's often attributable to the PZA and not the isoniazid. Ethambitol, of course, is uh, notorious for causing optic neuritis, although this complication is very rare, particularly at the lower dose of ethambitol that we use today. Uh, rifibutin and rifapentine noted there in the first-line drugs. These are uh, rifampin alternatives. They're, they're rifamycin drugs. Uh, we don't use them as much, but uh, they can be used. Multidrug resistant TB. I, I promised to say something about it. In the mid-90s, this seemed to be something that was increasing, or we were worried it was going to increase. Approximately 2% of cases in the U.S. in the early 90s were MDR TB. Multidrug resistant TB is defined by an isolate being resistant to both INH and rifampin. You can see there's been a slight trend down here, and we've been pretty steady at 1% uh, in terms of uh, MDR TB in the U.S. for the last decade. So let's talk now about latent TB infection and eventually talk about some of the screening uh, tools you have uh, in that setting. What is the incidence or prevalence of latent TB infection in this country? This is a hard thing to discern. This is based on skin test data. This is data from an NHANES prevalence sur survey that was published several years ago. You can see the red circle there. In patients that are uh, age 45 to 64 or then 65 and above, you can see the, the LTBI or latent TB infection prevalence ranges between 3.4 and 4.8%. Now this is among US born persons. Uh, if you go over to the uh, foreign born population, which is several columns over, you can see that these, these are three to four to five times higher. And again, these are estimates based on the tuberculin skin test and uh, we're not quite sure how valid these estimates are, but, but they do give us a good shot that, again, in U.S.-born persons, that um, LTBI or latent TB infection is probably quite uh, not common. So let's talk about latent TB infection, or LTBI, as I'll call it. What are the risk factors for TB, LTBI? Well, I think I've already made the first one very clear. Clearly, if you were born in a country where TB is more endemic, this is the single biggest risk factor for LTBI in this country. Uh, if the patient's been exposed knowingly to TB, perhaps family members, particularly in the 30s or 40s or, or, or earlier in the 19 or 1900s in this country when TB was more common, some patients will give you a history, oh, I remember when grandma went away to the mountains for a year, uh, I don't know what it was for, but she came back. I mean, that's a reasonable history uh, of, of a patient perhaps going to a TB sanitarium years, years ago. So I do inquire quite closely about family history and potential uh, TB in parents or grandparents. Otherwise, within this country, there are several settings of higher TB prevalence, of course, jails or prisons, homeless shelters, healthcare centers sometimes, and most healthcare workers in this country have a very low TB risk. However, some uh, that work in TB centers or around high-risk patients certainly have higher risk. Uh, and then inquiring about uh, a, a history of prior TB screening tests and therapy, uh, or perhaps a chest radiograph finding of fibronodular uh, pasties in the upper lobes, these things are associated with a higher risk of uh, LTBI.
So how do we measure T cell responses to TB or, or test for TB exposure? Now this will be covered in more detail by some of the other lecturers in this series, uh, particularly uh, with regards to screening, again, for biologic therapies. Of course, this is the time-honored uh, TST or tuberculin skin test, otherwise known as the PPD, the purified protein derivative. Many people still call this the PPD. But, uh, but today we do call it the TST, and it's, th this technology is, again, very ancient. It's approximately 100 years old, and it uses uh, PPD, which is a crude antigen preparation of uh, a number of uh, antigens present in a wide variety of mycobacterium, not just TB. And uh, generally speaking, we measure the induration caused by this test, and 10 millimeters of induration is generally a positive test result. However, as you know, for immunocompromised patients, we lower that bar. We want to increase our sensitivity even at the expense of specificity, but we don't want to miss patients. So we will lower the bar to 10 millimeters and use that as a cut point to define a TST positive result. Of course, we always say if, if the patient's negative, Remember, the patient could be anergic. If they're immunosuppressed, maybe the TST is not working very well. You have a false negative result. So consider that patient's a priori risk or their epidemiologic risk factors and their radiologic findings before you conclude whether someone has LTBI or not. And what are the problems with TST? Well, clearly you have to have it placed. You have to come back two to three days later and have it read. This can be a, um, a hindrance for some patients as well as providers. Uh, there is poor inner reader reliability. I don't know if, uh, how many of you out there have actually read a TST. I've stood around with nurses before debating, is this nine millimeters or 10 millimeters? We've had three or four doctors in the room at one time trying to decide if this person's negative or positive based on one millimeter of induration. Uh, I mentioned the problem with false neg negative results uh, in patients that are anergic. There is this issue also with false positive results. The TST, because it is built on this crude antigen preparation called PPD, uh, it is um, a, not a very specific test in some regards. Patients that uh, have had a prior BCG vaccination uh, certainly can have false positive skin tests from that prior uh, vaccine. And then patients who've been sensitized uh, by NTM or non-TB mycobacterium uh, can also have a false positive uh, screening test. Uh, and again, this tool has, because of its specificity concerns and because we live in a low prevalence zone, uh, it has a very poor positive predict predictive value in the United States. So enter the IGRAs, the interferon gamma release assays. There's two IGRAs that are commercially available and FDA approved for use in this country. Uh, the one is the T-spot TB test, the other is the quantiferon. You're going to hear more about these tests and their test uh, characteristics later in this uh, speaker series. Uh, suffice it to say, these tests are similar in what they accomplish. They measure, uh, the, in the T-spots case, they measure the number of reactive lymphocytes against um, TB antigen. And in the quantiferon case, it measures the amount of interferon gamma that is dumped uh, in reaction to TB antigen. So the key here is the TB antigens being used. This is not a PPD-based test. These tests rely on ESAT-6 and CFP-10, and in the case of quantiferon, also an antigen called 7.7. .7. These antigens are derived from a genome that is relatively highly specific uh, to MTB. And you can see there that, and I think this slide is also shown by another speaker in this series, but these uh, antigens are not present in the BCG substrains used to uh, make BCG vaccine, and they're largely only present in the MTB complex organisms. The exception is Mycobacterium kinsaceae and Marinum and Shulgai. Uh, kinsaceae will cause uh, false positive agros, or we believe they do, uh, they, they will, this will occur. M. kinsaceae is a bug in the southern U.S. Uh, it can cause clinical disease similar to TB. Marinum and Shulgai are much more rare, however. So, so the amount of false positive tests due to these bugs is very unclear, but it's probably quite low. So how do we evaluate the utility of the agro? Uh, and how do we compare its uh, sensitivity and specificity with that of the skin test. Of course, this is the challenge. There is no gold standard for latent TB infection. We don't know who's actually infected and who isn't. So to do so, we've relied on, on uh, patients with active TB. So here's, here's a slide uh, from a nice uh, publication reviewing the test characteristics of both these tests. And you can see on uh, the TST and the IGRA columns that the estimated sensitivity is somewhat higher for the IGRAs. Now, these data largely come from uh, experiences using active TB cases, people who have culture-confirmed active TB. And again, these are screening tests meant to de 
to detect latent TB infection. But when you use them with patients with active TB, again, that can be used as a gold standard, of course. They have culture-confirmed TB. We do see the iGRIS have a slightly higher sensitivity. Uh, the specificity studies are much harder to do because, again, there is no gold standard. However, uh, if you line up patients who are from low endemic areas uh, with no TB risk factors, much of the data here suggests that the IGRAs have higher uh, specificity, again, somewhere in the 95 to 100% range, whereas the TST, depending on the population being studied, is lower. If that population has BCG vaccine uh, prevalent in, within it, then, of course, the specificity uh, is lower. So what are the new CDC guidelines? Uh, CDC published this in 2010 in the MMWR, and uh, they came out with um, a preference for IGRAs in, in several scenarios. One is, is, is quite an easy recommendation to make. Uh, in any patient who's unlikely to return for a TST reading, you ought to prefer uh, the IGRA. Uh, the second instance was uh, in patients who have BCG vaccine histories. Now, BCG vaccine histories can be difficult to obtain. Many patients don't know that they've been vaccinated before. However, um, if they can tell you where they came from and you know their age, you can make good guesses at this. Sometimes patients have a scar on their arm. Uh, there is a BCG atlas that's present on the web. You could Google that and come up uh, with some uh, data in terms of country-specific BCG history of, of use. Um, the new CDC guidelines do say that the skin test is still the preferred test in children under five. Um, this is largely due to an absence of IGRA data in this group, and it's also largely due to the fact that probably neither the skin test or the IGRA works that well in young children. Their immune systems are not um, as mature as, as adults, and these, these tests will be less sensitive in this group of kids. And frankly, when I'm screening kids under age five, I tend to use both tests to improve my sensitivity. Within this document, however, there was very little specific guidance given uh, to the use of these tests in immunocompromised settings, uh, as well as the use of the quantitative values for the quantifuron uh, and the T-spot. These are not just black and white positive negative tests. They do have actual numbers behind them. The higher, probably the more uh, true the positive. The lower, probably the less true the positive. And one of the, the speakers uh, still to come will get into this more. So screening in the setting of immunosuppression. Uh, of, of course, we all know that various as or forms of immunosuppression can increase the risk of LTBI progression to active disease, renal disease, cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, organ transplant, et cetera. And we know that immunosuppressive therapies, again, can also enhance this risk, corticosteroids being notorious, TNF drugs, anti-T cell therapies, and others. And again, some of the risks of these specific compounds and the mechanisms of action uh, involved with TB reactivation will be covered by other speakers in this series. The IGRA role in screening immunosuppressed patients, there's many questions here. How do we use IGRA? Should we use them to rep in replacement of the TST? Should we use them alongside as a supplement to the TST? Uh, five years ago, we had very little data to answer these questions. And really, more recently, we, there's a large number of head-to-head -head studies with, with quite a bit of heterogeneity. However, there is some data now to draw some conclusions, uh, particularly within the field of rheumatic diseases. And we will we'll examine that data later in the speaker series. To finish up, LTBI treatment, nine months of isoniazin has been the standard uh, in the U.S. is the preferred therapy. Four months of Rifampin is a, an alternative thought to be similar in its efficacy of nine months of INH. Six months of INH is not as effective as nine months and is not, uh, is not preferred. Uh, generally speaking, we advise starting INH one month prior to starting anti-TNF initiation. And this really largely comes from one study. It's the Spanish experience where they published uh, the efficacy of their screening algorithm, where they actually use a skin test to screen patients in two-step fashion prior to uh, TNF start. And they noted an 83% reduction in their TB cases. Um, and they, their algorithm was to start INH one month uh, or I'm sorry, to start INH and to start anti-TNF therapy one month after that. Now, in truth, you can probably just wait two weeks or one week, and you might be able to even just start them concurrently. There is data to support that. Uh, I like to have at least some gap of several weeks to ensure that the patient has actually picked up their INH, they're taking it, they're tolerating it. So I think at least several weeks gap is, is clinically very useful. And lastly, I'll note that some of these patients are on other hepatotoxic drugs, methotrexate, statins, et cetera, and liver function testing is a must at baseline, and then periodically throughout, uh, monthly, really, if they're on other hepatotoxic drugs. Uh, again, this is important, particularly in this setting. And lastly, there is a new 
therapy option that has just been published, and this is called 3IR, it's three months of INH and rifapentine. And this is actually a 12-dose therapy. It's given once a week under directly observed therapy for 12 weeks. And this study was just published in New England Journal by CDC. Uh, it was a multi-center trial, and you can see that uh, in the isoniazid, in the modified intention to treat analysis, in the INH only wing, there was 15 cases of TB, and in the combination therapy, or the 3IR wing of the study, there was only seven cases, and the rate was roughly half. Same for the pre-protocol analysis. Again, the rate was half in the 3IR therapy. From a safety standpoint, the, the INH rifapentine therapy appeared similar to the INH. Rifapentine is a long-acting rifamycin. That, that way it can be given once a week with the INH. Now again, this was studied under the conditions of directly observed therapy. It is recommended to be given as DOT or directly observed therapy. Uh, but again, this is something that uh, may evolve and is something to be aware of and potentially it's useful to you uh, in treating patients prior to immunosuppressive therapy. With that, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues and collaborators. Again, Len Calabrese and Cleveland Clinic, thanks for being here, or thanks for having me here.